morning, everyone. Thank you for joining the webinar this morning. We're now going to get started. Um, just a few technology tips before we get going here. Um, all attendees will be muted throughout the presentation. Every once in a while, just be sure to tap your mouse so that the screen doesn't go to sleep on you. Um, there will be time for questions and answers at the end of the presentation, but feel free to text chat them in throughout the presentation. Um, to text chat a question in, there should be a red arrow on the upper right-hand corner of your screen. Just click to expand that, and there will be a text box there that you can uh, text in the questions, and they'll come to us here, and then we'll hold them all till the end and ask them of Robert at that time. And finally, a recording of today's presentation will be available on farmcredits.com slash webinar uh, for playback at a later time. And now we will begin. Good morning. My name is Chris Lawton, and I'm director of the Knowledge Exchange Program here at Farm Credit East. Among the things that we produce in Knowledge Exchange is our winter webinar series. This is one of the first webinars that we have on covering uh, the Affordable Care Act. Uh, we have others coming up, including a dairy outlook in January. Um, I'll go ahead and introduce our speaker today, Robert Noonan. Um, Bob Noonan is a practicing attorney and founder of Robert Noonan and Associates. His law firm focuses on human resource law and often on healthcare related issues. He served as vice president and counsel for the Connecticut Business and Industry Association. He's endorsed by the Connecticut Green Industries Association. And I should note that although he's based in Connecticut, what he'll be talking about today applies throughout our entire region. He's done numerous webinars and live events on this topic, and he's recognized as an, event, as an expert on the Affordable Care Act. Um, he's done webinars for us before, so uh, welcome back, Bob Noonan. Oh, great. Thank you very much, and good morning, everyone. It's nice to have the opportunity to uh, uh, present to you um, the program on the Affordable Care Act, it's particularly uh, timely uh, given the national events that have occurred. Before I proceed further, Chris, I want to make sure that uh, my screen is available to everyone. Um, okay. So uh, let's let's talk about. I'm going to give a certain perspective here from uh, one state, that being Connecticut, but this is a national effort to ensure people, you'll see the estimates vary um, from about 34 million people in the United States without insurance to about 45 million. Um, if you look at Connecticut, we'll just take put Connecticut under the microscope here for a second. Uh, the people, there are about 344,000 people in Connecticut that don't have insurance. Uh, we're lower as a state than national average with respect to uninsured. 9.7% uh, of the Connecticut population is uninsured, as opposed to about 15% of the United States population that doesn't have insurance. Um, incidentally, uh, Massachusetts has the lowest rate of uninsured uh, people, and Connecticut, uh, Connecticut, Texas has the highest rate. About 25% of the Texas population is uninsured. Now, what's important about the Connecticut statistic is that it reflects uh, the national statistic. Uh, of the 344,000 people that don't have insurance in Connecticut, only 9% of them work full time. The rest of them either are unemployed or work on the margins of employment. And given the nature of agricultural employment and horticultural employment, many of the people uh, that you employ will fit that characteristic of being on the margins of employment by virtue of the fact that they're temporary or seasonal or in some cases uh, per diem. In terms, and, and these are the people that the law is looking, the, the heretofore uninsured uh, are, the tar, are the targets of this law, the, the objective being to get them insured. In terms of composition, uh, uninsured by ethnicity. They're white, Hispanic, and black in that order. And they are typically found um, in where uh, the populations are the highest, the highest concentrations. They're found in cities. Now, in terms of the national experiment here to enroll people, uh, we have varying degrees of success on exchanges. This law contemplates that every state will set up an exchange, a marketplace whereby small employers and individuals can buy insurance. 
the, the law says to the states, uh, you have the responsibility to set up an exchange, and if you don't, uh, says the federal government, we'll do it for you. Well, the federal government didn't, did not contemplate so many states basically saying, go ahead, federal government, set up, set up an exchange, be our guest, but we're not going to do that. And the result has been that the states and the federal government have varying degrees of success. The federal government, generally speaking, has done a poorer job of enrolling people and getting their website going, as we all know from the national press, uh, than have the states. And the states have done, as a group, better than the federal government. And states vary in their own performance. So for example, Kentucky is probably uh, one of the best states in having an exchange that's up and operating. Connecticut has done pretty well. Massachusetts was, which was surprising to me, um, was in a situation where they couldn't, uh, when people enrolled, they couldn't tell them about their uh, subsidies. New York had problems with its exchange until it quadrupled its servers. And so it goes with varying degrees of success. Now those technical problems, both on the state and federal level, are starting to iron themselves out. But nonetheless, this has been, as we all know, a very, very rocky start. In your state, uh, there will be an exchange that will have certain insurance carriers offering products. Uh, insurance carriers do, are not confined to only offering products on your state exchange. Uh, so there are some carriers that have chosen to not participate in all in the exchange. Some have chosen to participate by only offering individual coverage or group coverage. But the number of carriers and the, uh, the identification of the carriers is going to vary on a state-by-state -state basis. And so in some states we have, well, in some states, um, the exchanges are offering a choice of one carrier particularly in the federal exchanges. In Connecticut, you'll see that we have uh, carriers, different carriers for uh, individual coverage and group coverage. So we have three carriers offering individual coverage and three offering group co coverage. When you are looking to insurance that's available, you have to look uh, at insurance which is available in your state, both on the exchange and off the exchange. Now, the prices on the exchange, there's, a, there's an allowance, a limited allowance uh, in this law for insurance prices to vary by age and geography. So in, if you look at um, the Connecticut uh, rates by age, we just took, for an example, um, age 21, age 40, and age 60 for a single county in Connecticut. So you see a 21-year-old will pay for the lowest level plan about $200 a month. A 40-year-old will pay for that same plan about $250 a month, and a 60-year-old will pay about uh, $540 a month for that same coverage. Plans can uh, vary in their prices on a limited basis with respect to age and geography. And age is a particularly important component uh, of this in terms of the pricing of the plants. Now, when <coughs> um, we were talking, that is the staff of uh, Farm Credit East and I were talking uh, before the program began, um, one of the questions that we discussed was the matter of your interest in your obligation as an employer with respect to this law. And the basic question is this. If, if I'm, what are my obligations if I'm under 50 employees? What are my obligations if I'm 50 or more employees? And so that demarcation, that employee count, is going to be very, very important. We're going to talk a little bit more about that as we proceed through this discussion. But for purposes of um, getting to the point succinctly, if you are under 50, what are your obligations to provide coverage? The answer is, if you are under 50 employees, you have no obligation to provide coverage, nor do you have an obligation to pay for group health insurance coverage for your employees. Your obligations as a small employer are basically to provide your employees with a notice. 
And along the way, as this law continues to unfold, you may have other notice obligations to your employees, but they're going to be relatively few. Um, right now, they're confined to a single notice telling employees there's an exchange in your state um, where you can obtain coverage. Now, the thing to keep in mind, though, is that if you're a small employer, you have no obligation to provide coverage. Every one of your employees, though, as in a taxpayer, has an obligation to have coverage. So uh, the obligation to have coverage is between your employee and the United States government. But if you are a smaller employer, you have no obligation to provide it. Now, if you're a larger employer, that is, you have 50 or more employees, now you have a special obligation to provide provide coverage which is adequate and affordable to your employees. And if not, uh, as an employer, you will pay a penalty. Um, I'll note for the um, people on the call from Massachusetts, you have the most experience with a mandatory coverage law because Massachusetts, which is the model for the federal law, the Massachusetts law was passed in 2006. It took effect in 2007. And unlike the federal law that sets the threshold at 50 employees, the Massachusetts law set the threshold in employers with 11 uh, or more employees. It was since raised to 20 employees. But nonetheless, uh, Massachusetts was there first with a mandatory coverage law and set the threshold at a very uh, low level in terms of the employee count. Now, here's what this brings us to. In um, the reason why this uh, session, I think, represents an opportunity um, to get our organizations in the right posture for um, the future. Here's what will happen. In 2016, uh, employers are going to get notices from the Internal Revenue Service, from the Treasury Department, basically saying that one of your employees went off on the exchange and got coverage on the exchange. We believe it was your obligation, employer, to provide that coverage. So either uh, pay the penalty or show us that the penalty should not apply to you. So let's talk a little bit more about this matter of a preview of coming attractions for 2016. The United States government is saying to an employer, um, if you're a large employer, you have to provide coverage which is adequate and affordable. And if you don't, you're subject to a penalty. The penalty is going to come in one of three forms. A penalty because you're not providing coverage, or the coverage you're providing is inadequate, or the coverage you're providing is unaffordable. The trigger, though, will be an employee who goes off on the exchange and receives a subsidy. And so typically what I do to explain the matter of this triggering element is to give um, employers a hypothetical that consists of two companies. And I'd like you to consider this um, for a second. We have two companies. Uh, both have 65 employees. And neither one of the companies is providing coverage to the employees. Now, as the slide indicates, the trigger to a penalty is an employee enrolling in coverage on the state exchange, the exchange in your state, and getting a subsidy. The United States government says to taxpayers, we all have to have health insurance or pay a penalty. Employers with 50 or more employees, you have a special obligation to provide it. Uh, if an individual says, that's great, United States government, but I can't afford it. The government says, well, depending on how much money you make, we're going to give you a helping hand in paying for it. Now, we're going to use is, is the, the line of demarcation, that is the reference point for giving you money, the federal poverty level. And the government says, if your income is at or below four times the federal poverty level and you get coverage on the exchange, we'll help you pay for it. That translates into this. The federal poverty level for a single uh, filer on a tax return, we're going to say is about $10,000. 
four times that is forty thousand dollars. For a family of four, that's the uh, four times the federal poverty level brings us to an income of ninety four thousand dollars or so. So a person who's a taxpayer with a family of four on the tax return can earn up to ninety four thousand two hundred dollars and the United States government will help that person pay for his or her coverage. So it's four times the federal poverty level and a person will qual can qualify for a subsidy. Let's go back to our two companies. Two companies uh, each have 65 employees. Neither company is offering coverage. But in our first company, it is Physicians Health Services. It's 65 doctors and every one of them is making $250,000. And the second company, we have Sunnybrook Farms, 65 employees, average income $35,000. In each one of those companies, an employee goes off on the exchange and applies for coverage. And the question becomes, uh, which one of these companies, either or both, will be subject to a penalty? And the answer is going to be only the farm. Why is that? Because none of the doctors will qualify for a subsidy. They're all making $250,000. Uncle Sam is not going to help them pay for their coverage. It maxes out at four times the federal poverty level. Now, if we change the facts, all of a sudden I made a mistake. It's actually 64 doctors and one receptionist. And the receptionist is making $35,000 a year. If the receptionist goes off on the exchange and gets a subsidy, the medical practice is in for the same penalty just as the farm is. What's the penalty? If you're not offering coverage, again, if you're over 50, 50 or more employees is the critical number. If you are over 50 employees, you're not offering coverage, and an employee gets coverage on the exchange and receives a helping hand, financial helping hand, a subsidy from the government, the penalty to the employer is $2,000 for every full-time employee minus 30 full-timers. If the employer is offering coverage, but the coverage is inadequate or too expensive, and an employee gets coverage on the exchange and receives a subsidy, now the penalty is $3,000 for that employee and every employee like that employee to the limit of what the penalty would be if the employer didn't offer coverage at all. So the max an employer, the maximum penalty is going to be $2,000 for every full-timer minus the first 30 full-time employees. But I'd like you to keep in mind a couple of things. First, um, the fact that this applies to an employer with 50 or more employees. Second, the triggers will be, first, an employee getting coverage on the exchange, and second, and only second, getting a subsidy. However, for all of us, what's important is the fact that in 2016, the employer is going to be sending notices to employers saying, we think you should have provided coverage to your employee. Here is the penalty. Either show, pay the penalty or show us that it doesn't apply to you. And your documentation is going to become very important because what you're going to be, uh, some of you will be saying is, it doesn't apply to us because we don't have 50 or more employees. Here is our employee count. Or it doesn't apply to us be, even though we are over 50, we offered coverage and the employee declined it. Or even though we're over 50, this employee was not a full-time employee, and here are the records to back that up. So for all of us, defensive documentation in, with respect to this law is going to become very important. And so the fact that we're on this call gives us an opportunity to consider this as a form of compliance project where a little doing a little homework now will go a long way. We're going to talk about two components of this law. Uh, the individual mandate and the employer mandate. Now beginning on January 1st of 2014, with some exceptions, every one of your employees has an obligation to have health insurance 
coverage in 2014 and for the him or herself and your employees dependents the people that the list is dependents on the tax return and if the person does not have coverage the United States government says and now you will have to pay a penalty there's going to be a special allowance though to excuse certain taxpayers uh, and we're going to talk about that the penalty the penalty is going to be calculated on uh, by one of two formulas the formula is either going to be a percentage of the person's income or it's going to be a flat dollar amount it's going to be whichever is the greater of those two so all your employees will either have to have coverage or if they don't they're going to have to pay a penalty and they'll be re unless they're excused from paying the penalty and they're going to report their coverage status or pay the penalty on the tax returns now the percentage of income is going to be an amount a percentage 1% 2 per in 2014 2% 2 in 2015 and 2.5% 2 thereafter based on the difference between the person's income tax filing threshold and the person's income. I'll talk about that in just one second. But let's keep in, in mind that it's going to be the greater of either a percentage of income or a flat dollar amount. And again, the percentage of income is 1% in 2014. The flat dollar amount is $95 in 2014, $325 in 2015, and $695 in 2016. And so if a person doesn't have coverage, the person is going to have to compute whether or not the income penalty or the flat dollar amount penalty is going to apply. Now that's going to be assessed on the taxpayer, not only for him or herself, but each one of the person's uh, tax dependents. The amount for kids is one half the adult amount. And there are going to be some caps on it. So the total family cap is going to be um, the three times the flat dollar amount. But let's take an example just to illustrate the way the penalty is going to work. Let's say we have a person with an annual income of $50,000, and there is a filing threshold in that person's tax bracket of $10,000. And so what we're going to do is subtract the filing threshold amount, the $10,000, from the person's income. So it's $50,000 minus $10,000. That gives us $40,000. Now the person is either, the person does not have coverage in this example. The person is going to have to pay the greater of either the income amount or the flat dollar amount. The income amount in 2014 is 1%. So if we take 1% of the person's income minus the filing threshold, $40,000 times 1%, it gives us $400. In 2014, the flat dollar amount is $95 because $400 is greater, the income amount, $400, is greater than $95. The person will have to pay $400 on his or her tax return. Uh, for not having coverage in 2014. Now the IRS issued a notice um, that is important to both employers and employees. IRS notice 2013-42 uh, that came out in June basically says this to your employees. Um, employee taxpayer, um, you have to have coverage in 2014 and for every month that you don't have coverage you're going to have to pay one twelfth of that penalty uh, that we discussed. Every month of non-coverage is one twelfth of the penalty up to a maximum of ninety five dollars in the flat dollar amount or one percent of income. Uh, this notice goes on to say uh, this however taxpayer if your employer is offering a group health plan and it has an enrollment in 2014, we are going to excuse you from that penalty for every month you didn't have coverage in 2014 
as long as you enroll in the employer's plan in 2014. It basically says to employees, if your employer is offering coverage, um, we're going to give you the opportunity to be excused from the penalty as long as you enroll in that coverage in 2014. It actually adds um, greater pressure uh, on the employer, frankly, because it says to employees, you better enroll in your employee's plan. Now, with respect to your employees in 2014, as I've said, they're going to have to have health insurance uh, or they're going to pay a penalty uh, on a monthly basis. The person is going to have to have minimum essential, uh, minimum essential coverage for him or herself and that person's dependents or be excused from paying the penalty or pay that penalty on the tax return. A person has minimum essential coverage um, for a month as long as the person is enrolled in coverage for at least one day in that month for himself or herself and that person's dependents. The taxpayer who claims the dependent is liable for the penalty. So in some cases you have mom and dad have gotten a divorce and they switch off uh, in alternate years the kids as tax dependents. Whoever, whichever parent is carrying the kids as dependents for that year has the obligation to make sure that they have coverage or pay the penalty. Uh, people who are married and file joint income tax returns are jointly liable. Now, we all have to have health insurance coverage that meets the definition of a minimum essential coverage. That includes coverage from the employer, coverage purchased in the individual market, Medicare, Medicaid, the children's health insurance programs, and veterans benefits, uh, veterans health coverage, uh, TRICARE, TRINET. Uh, it doesn't include things like uh, workers' comp or short-term disability or long-term disability or cancer insurance or vision or dental. It has to be group health insurance that we're all required to have. Now, if people don't have that coverage, um, they are either going to have to pay a penalty or be excused from paying a penalty. So if a person's income is such that um, they fall below the threshold for filing an income tax return, for example, uh, uh, $9,750 in 2012 would be the threshold, well, they're not going to be penalized. People who qualify for religious exemption can go onto the exchange in your state and get a hardship certificate um, saying I should be excused from the penalty because of a religious uh, objection. Incidentally, um, there is a case that's going to be coming up before the United States Supreme Court in March about this religious exemption. Um, there are uh, three organizations involved. Uh, Hobby Lobby is one, Hobby Lobby Incorporated. Uh, Mardell is another. And basically the question is going to be whether a corporation can say that uh, providing a health insurance plan with contraceptive benefits violates that corporation's religious beliefs. It will be very interesting to see how that uh, case unfolds. It builds on this um, Citizens United case uh, and um, the decision will probably come out in June. For individuals though, they can go on to the uh, exchange in the state and say, I have a religious exemption, therefore I shouldn't pay the penalty. Illegal aliens are not entitled to a subsidy, not entitled to coverage on the exchange, and will have to pay a penalty. Incarcerated individuals are excused. Members of Indian tribes are covered under the Indian Health Services Act, and then uh, so they're uh, not subject to a penalty. And people have to pay more than eight percent of their income, household income for health insurance, also will not be penalized. Let's talk about your employees and paying for coverage. Um, the Affordable Care Act is a law that is taking, is taking the floor of um, coverage and moving it up. So this law is saying what the federal government said to states is this. We're going to allow you and we are going to give you money to increase uh, Medicaid eligibility 
from 100% of the federal poverty level to 133% of the federal poverty, or 138% of the federal poverty level. Now, people between 138 and 400% of the federal poverty level can get coverage on the exchange and get a subsidy. And people above 400% of the federal poverty level are making enough money so they can get coverage on their own and says the United States government, we don't have to help them. So what you have here is Medicaid being available to more people. Now earlier I had shown you a slide about Connecticut enrollments on the exchange. About half of those first month enrollments were people being enrolled in Medicaid. Now, uh, it's interesting, I think, that some states had turned to the federal government and said, well, you know what, we're going to keep Medicaid at 100% of the federal poverty level. We're not going to boost it up to 138%, even though you're going to give us the money. And oddly enough, there are some people whose income is over 100% of the federal poverty level, so they're not entitled to Medicaid but their income is lower than 138% of the federal poverty level, so they're not entitled to a subsidy, and they are caught right in the middle. Um, but the, the idea of subsidies is to say that if you're below 138% of the federal poverty level, unless your state said no, um, when you enroll in the exchange, we are going to enroll you in Medicaid, and therefore, of the 35 million people that don't have insurance in the United States, um, you will be covered now by virtue of your being enrolled in Medicaid. For people between 138 and 400 percent of the federal poverty level, um, Uncle Sam says, you can get coverage on the exchange and we're going to help you pay for it. Now, for your employees, here's what this means. The amount of the subsidy that they're going to get from the United States government is going to vary on their income in relation to the federal poverty level. But what the government is saying to, them, to us is this. Uh, an individual can go on the exchange and uh, qualify for a subsidy and purchase in a plan on the exchange. In the plan, the most that they, the, the best plan that they can purchase on the exchange is the silver plan. It's actually the second lowest silver plan on the exchange. Just by way of background, uh, plans on the exchange will have different levels of coverage. They're based on an actuarial value of benefits, but it's 60, 70, or 80 percent. And the government is just using the Olympic medal system. So a bronze plan, the lowest plan, is covers 60% of the benefits. A silver plan is 70%, a gold plan is 80%, and then there can be a platinum plan that is 90% of the benefits are covered. So a person can go on the exchange. The exchange will, will determine what the person's income is, and then the person can select a plan. Now, based on that person's income, there is a limit as to how much the person is going to have to pay to purchase that coverage. So if we take a look at the chart, uh, up to 133% of the federal poverty level, the most the person is going to have to pay for a silver plan is going to be 2% of income. At 150 to 200 percent of the federal poverty level, the most a person is going to have to pay to buy a silver plan is 4 to 6.3% of income. At 200 to 250 percent of the federal poverty level, the most a person is going to pay is 6.3 to 8.05 percent of income. And so it goes. Let's take a look at this. Sarah is a 45-year-old uh, employee uh, with an income limit that's uh, at the level of 250 percent to 300 percent of the federal poverty level, second to the last line. Uh, the cost, Sarah wants to buy a plan on the exchange, and the cost of that silver plan is $5,733. Now, the most she has to pay based on that schedule is 8.5% of income, 
or the most Sarah will have to pay for that plan that is worth $5,733 is $2,313. Sarah will be able to purchase a plan costing $5,700 for about $2,300. She's going to receive $3,400 uh, from the United States government. Sarah, every month, will make a payment to that insurance carrier, a monthly premium, one twelfth of twenty three thirteen. She'll be paying her portion to the insurance carrier, and the exchange in her state will be sending to the insurance carrier money received on Sarah's behalf from the United States government. And so it will go with enrollments on the exchange. People will be screened for Medicaid. Your employees will be screened for Medicaid. Then they'll be screened for a subsidy uh, if they choose to enroll in a plan. Now, that's, that's the, um, in, in the individual mandate and enrollment on the exchange. Every person come January 1st of 2014, Every person in the United States has to have health insurance or pay a penalty or be excused from paying the penalty. And the United States government will help people pay for their coverage. <clears throat> of particular importance to us will be people who are excused from having coverage for a portion of 2014 because their employer is offering coverage, there's an open enrollment date in 2014, and they enroll in that coverage. Also, there are people who will not have coverage but will not be subject to a penalty because they don't earn enough money or they are uh, not subsidy eligible uh, or there is some other allowance, religious exemption, illegal aliens, incarcerated individuals. And so um, the tax return, our tax returns, become the mechanism of enforcement of this law. That's the individual mandate. Now let's talk about the employer mandate. I want to go to a point that I made uh, earlier, which is this. Uh, if I am, I'll come back to this slide in just one second. Let's just, I just want to review the matter of over 50, under 50. If I am under 50 employees, what's my obligation to provide coverage? The answer is I have none. I have an obligation to give my employees notice about health care reform, but beyond that, I have no obligation. All my employees have an independent obligation to the United States government to have coverage which is adequate or they will pay a penalty, but as a small employer, I have no obligation to provide it. Now, if I'm a larger employer, though, the matter is different. Now I have an obligation, what the United States government is calling a shared responsibility, um, to provide coverage which is adequate and affordable to my full-time employees. And this is where, for all of us, documentation, doing our homework is going to become important. I'm going to give you um, a, a kind of shorthand that we are using with employers in terms of looking at the matter of, of this law. I'm going to give you the three C's. Count, classify, and control the workforce. Uh, the count that you make in 2014 determines whether or not you have an obligation to provide coverage in 2015. Classifying employees is going to determine which of your employees you're going to, uh, you will be providing coverage uh, to. Uh, that is, classifying will determine whether or not you're going to consider them full-time. And controlling your workforce means that you're going to make, be making conscious decisions about employment so that you are not going to slip into non-compliance or slip into a, um, a bill, insurance coverage, that you would not have to provide otherwise. And I'll give you some, a couple of examples about controlling the workforce. Uh, the state of Virginia has said, if you are a part-time employee working for the state of Virginia, you may not work more than 29 hours, period. Virginia said, we are going to make sure that part-time employees don't slip into full-time status 
by putting a limit on the number of hours that they work. The Darden Corporation in Florida has said, we are going to limit the number of full-time employees that we have because of the health care expense. Um, some of the larger employers have been looking at uh, spousal coverage and the cost of spousal coverage. There's no obligation to provide coverage for spouses under this law. So I think what's important is to consider um, the control of the workforce as a means of making conscious decisions about coverage and limiting your liability. So count, classify, and control uh, I think are uh, very important. Again, if you're under 50 though and you do the, the count, uh, the only thing you have to worry about is the exchange notice and that uh, the law says that every employer regardless of size has to give employees a notice about uh, the exchange in that employee's state within 14 days of the new hire. But for small employers, um, that's basically our only obligation, although our employees all have an independent obligation to government. Now for large employers, here's the problem with this law. The law is using terms in a look at the workforce that we don't use. This, says, this law says employers with 50 or more full-time and full-time equivalent employees have to offer coverage to employees and their dependents working an average of 30 hours a week, and that coverage has to be affordable and have minimum value beginning in 2015 or the employer will pay a penalty. Well, the problem with the statement is this. We don't think of our employees as being full-time equivalents. We generally we say we have full-time employees or part-time employees, but don't really think of employees as being equivalent to full-time. And we don't usually say, well, we're going to provide you with benefits based on the average hours that you work. It's either you're regularly scheduled to work 30 hours a week or more, in which case we'll give you insurance benefits, or you're not, in which case we won't. This law changes the way employers are going to be thinking about their workforces. This goes to the classification. Now, the ACA, the mandate on the Affordable Care Act, um, in effect was delayed until 2015 for employers. Theoretically, there are only three aspects of the law that were delayed until 2015. A report that employers have to provide about their health insurance coverage to the United States government. A report that insurance carriers had to provide to about their plans to the United States government. And the penalty. Um, so if an employer did not provide adequate and affordable coverage, the employer would be um, penalized. Well, that penalty was supposed to arise in 2014. That penalty has been delayed until 2015. As a practical matter, though, by delaying the penalty, we delay the employer's obligation until the first day of your plan year in 2015. If on July 1, 2015, I'm a large employer, on that date, I have to provide my full-time employees with coverage which is adequate and affordable, which is why um, this call is, in my opinion, important, because we have to do work now and in 2014 to meet that compliance obligation in 2015. Now, the problem with this law is that the Treasury Department, when the mandate was delayed, said, um, this is unfortunate because we're going to miss $10 billion in revenue that we were counting on in 2014 through penalties, which I find astounding. But nonetheless, the IRS was anticipating $10 billion in penalties in the first year. Let's review the, uh, let's review the penalties again quickly. If I'm a large employer and I'm not offering coverage to my employees and an employee gets a subsidy on the exchange and gets coverage on the exchange, um, the penalty is $2,000 for every full-time employee that I have minus the first 30 full-timers. If I'm offering coverage but my coverage is too expensive or it's inadequate and an employee gets coverage on the exchange and gets a subsidy, now I'm going to pay $3,000 for that employee and every employee like that employee 
up to what coverage would the penalty would be if I didn't provide coverage at all. So it's three thousand dollars for every employee that gets a subsidy on the exchange, up to the limit of what I would pay if I didn't provide coverage at all. Now, your obligation uh, is going to arise. Your coverage obligation for a large employer is going to arise on the first day of your plan year in 2015. So it's important to know what your plan year is because that's your target date uh, for enrolling your full-timers. Um, your employees have to have coverage for themselves and their dependents. Spousal coverage is not required. Employers, your, your plan is not required to offer uh, spousal coverage. I presume that's a recognition uh, of the fact that in many cases we have both uh, both people in the uh, marriage uh, working, the two income households. Now, let's go to some employer issues that are important. First is, who's the employer? Second, am I a large employer, which is a critical question. What's affordable coverage? Who's a full-timer? And what is minimum essential coverage? Let's go to um, the employer 50 employee threshold. Every year you'll be counting up your workforce. And the count that I have in 2014 determines whether or not I have to provide coverage in 2015. In 2015, you're going to count your workforce and they'll determine whether or not you have an obligation in 2016. One of the pieces of defensive documentation is this, your workforce count. If for some reason, the IRS knocked on your door and said, um, one of your, your employees got coverage on the exchange, we think you should have provided it, pay the penalty or show us why it doesn't apply to you. Uh, some of you, I suspect many of you, will be able to say we're not a large employer. Here is our employer uh, employee count. Now, if you're in a situation where your organization owns subsidiaries, um, we have one company owning others, or one farm having uh, a relationship to other uh, businesses. There are special rules called control group rules, and even though you may have separate tax numbers, separate ID numbers, uh, if you have common ownership, you're going to be all your employees are going to be counted up as if you were one organization. That's a tax law question that you should, if you fall into that, um, you should refer that to your accounting uh, of firm uh, or your accounting department of finances. It's a, con it's a control group rule. So if you fall into that circumstance, um, let me just point out, talk with your accounting department or your accountants about uh, this section of the code. Section 414B, C, M, and O of the tax code and have that matter addressed. But let's assume that nobody has that control group rule problem. Um, here's, wh here's where we start into that count uh, classify and control. Uh, in 2014, I have to count up my workforce month by month to determine whether or not I'm a large employer. Now, the first question I would ask an employer is, is this. Um, do you have full-time employees? If the answer is yes. Do you have part-time employees? Uh, if the answer is yes, that becomes a very important answer. And then do you have seasonal employees? So let's assume we have an employer that has full-time employees and part-time employees. To determine how many employees I have for that month, first th the first thing I'm going to do for the month of January 2014 is put in the number of full-time employees. That is the number of people working 30 hours a week or more. I'm then going to ask the question, uh, employer, do you have part-time employees? Yes, we do. All right, give me the number of hours worked by your part-time staff. I don't, with any employee though, once an employee in January of 2014 is worked more than 120 hours, stop with that employee. Give me all the part-time hours worked by your part-timers in 2014. Nobody gets more than 120 hours, though. Stop at 120 for any employee. 
then I'm going to take those part-time hours in January of 2014, and I'm going to divide that total number by 120. Number of work hours in a month is the government sees it. And then I'm going to add the full-timers and those part-time equivalents, the, the part-timers hours divided by 120 gives me the full-time equivalents. And then I'm going to add those two numbers together. And that's going to tell me how many employees I had in, 20, in January of 2014. I'm going to do that for every month in 2014. And I'm going to take those 12 months, those totals, and divide by 12. And if the number comes up 50 or more, I am a large employer with an obligation to provide coverage in 2015. So for everyone on the call, if you're very large and you don't have to worry about being over 50, you are. That's fine. If you are very small and you really don't have to worry about being uh, at 50, that's less of an issue. I mean, if we're 3, 4, 5, 10 or so, that's less of an issue. But if we're somewhere in, in between, uh, the employer count becomes very, very important. And I'd like to show you how important it can be by asking you to look at this example. Uh, we have an employer in each month of 2014. I asked the question, uh, employer, let's classify your workforce. We have to count them up, but let's classify them. Do you have full-timers? Yes. Do you have part-timers? Yes, we do. Okay. How many full-timers do you have? Well, we have 20 full-time employees, that is, working more than 30 hours a week. Yes, we have 20 of those. Uh, working um, 35 hours a week. Do you have part-timers? Um, yes, we do. Uh, we have 40 part-time employees. Well, how, how much do they work in the month? Um, they each work 90 hours of service per month. Now, in order to determine whether or not I'm a large employer, I'm going to take my 40 part-time employees I'll multiply them by each one of them is working 90 hours a month. So I'm going to multiply 40 times 90 and then divide that total by 120. That gives me 30. When I take my 20 full-timers and my 30 full-time equivalents, I come up with 50 employees. If that's what I have in every month as an average in 2014, in 2015, I have an obligation to provide coverage. There's a limited exception for seasonals, and that's important for uh, most of us on this call. If you are over 50, but you're over 50 only for four months or less during the year, and the reason you are over 50 is because the people that threw you over 50 are seasonal employees you remain a small employer. So when we go to count and classify and then control, when we're looking at the count, we're also coming into classifying. Do we have part-timers? Do we have seasonals? And now there is this limited exception for seasonal employees that can become very, very important. Affordable coverage. Now I'm going to come back to this count in a little while, but that's the basic count. Uh, if I'm over um, 50 employees, I have to offer coverage which is adequate and affordable. What's affordable? Well, the law says if the cost of what an employee pays for coverage at your organization is more than 9.5% of the person's household income, it's too expensive. And if the person gets a subsidy, um, you can be penalized. Well, here's the problem. We don't know the employee's household income. So the law is saying to us as employers, we're going to give you a safe harbor. And in order to compute whether or not your coverage is affordable, you can use one of three methods. Now, the plan that you're measuring is going to be the lowest plan that you offer. And even though an employee has to have coverage for himself or her self-independence, you're not looking at that. You're only looking at what the employee pays for single-only coverage in the plan, the lowest plan that you offer. And if it's more than 9.5% of something, it's too expensive. Well, the something in the law is household income, but you don't know that. 
So the law is saying, here's what you can do, employer. You can take the employee's hourly rate of pay and, divide, and multiply it by 130. Or you can take what the employee is actually earning or the federal poverty level. Let's take a look at this. The rate of pay. If the cost of coverage when an employee contributes for the premium for the lowest plan that you offer, single only, does not exceed 9.5% of that employee's hourly rate times 130. Now it's 120 to look at how big are we, counting up. 130 is the number of pay hours in a month, says the government. So I can take my employee's hourly rate times 130 and look at what an employee pays for coverage. So if, for example, if we take in Connecticut the average hourly rate wage is $21.15 and we multiply that by 130, that gives us $2,750. 9.5% uh, of that is $261 per month. If an employee pays more than $261 per month for coverage, it's too expensive. Now here's what's good about this. It doesn't make any difference whether the employee works 130 hours. It's a straight pay rate determination. Here's what's bad about this. The employee works a lot of overtime and gets a bonus and gets uh, commissions. None of those go into that 130. It's a straight time pay rate. So the next measure I can use is I can look at the employee's W-2 earnings, box one W-2. All the overtime, all the commissions will go into box one W-2. What doesn't go into box one will be money that goes into a retirement plan uh, or a 401k plan. But if I fail under the hourly rate test, I can see what the employee has actually earned. The third measure you can use is the federal poverty level, which I don't think makes sense for, anyone, uh, for any of us. And in 2013, the federal poverty level in Connecticut was $11,490. If we divide that by 12, that gives us $9.57 a month. 9.5% of that is about $90 a month. So here's my recommendation on affordability. Take your five lowest hourly pay rates, full-time hourly pay rates. Multiply those by 130 and see what employees are charged for their coverage. Single only lowest plan that you offer. It doesn't make any difference whether or not they enroll in a better plan. You're only looking at single only coverage um, in the lowest plan that you offer. Use the five lowest full-time pay rates. If you fail under the affordability test using pay rates, look at what those employees have actually earned and test against actual earnings. If you fail under that test, then you have an affordability problem, and that's something you, you can um, remedy. Um, you'll be making, my recommendation is to use a supplemental employer premium contribution. But you could do that this afternoon. You could look at affordability as a rough index of, are we going to have a problem or not we, or, or aren't we, by looking at our full-time pay rates uh, now, and that'll give you a benchmark. The problem that's most difficult for most of us is uh, going to be in that uh, classifying employees and then controlling employees, count, control, and classify. And the difficulty is uh, this matter of full-timers. Now, the law is defining somebody who's working full-time as somebody who's, regularly, uh, who's working 30 hours a week or more um, with a full-timer when you hire a full-timer, you can wait 90 days, no more than 90 days, but they have to be enrolled in coverage. If you have 200 or more full-timers, you have to automatically enroll them. Um, the problem is going to be on um, identifying who's a full-timer when you have people whose hours might go up and down. So for your our industry, for the work that you do, you have some very special issues because you're going to have seasonal employees. You're going to have some people who work part-time sometimes, but their hours can go up and down, frankly, depending upon a lot of conditions, not the least of which is the weather. 
uh, you might also have some special problems with per diems and people on salary. But the seasonal employees and the part-timers who, us, whose hours go up and down are particular problems. Now, I mentioned the matter of count, control, and classify. And I said that this law looks at people, employees, in a way that is different from the way employers look at employees. Because we look at people as being generally full-time or part-time. But this law is saying, well, there are people whose hours are not full-time or cleanly full-time or part-time because they vary. You know, they're the part-timers whose hours go up and down or they don't work the entire year. They're seasonal employees. The law is using the term variable hour employees. If you hire somebody, and you don't know really how long the person's going to be working, either throughout the course of the year or the course of the week or the month, because their hours may go up and down, you may call them variable hour employees. So instead of just having full-time and part-time, uh, many of you will uh, should consider saying we have full-time employees and part-time employees, and some of those people are also going to be considered variable hour employees. With a full-time employee, our obligation is to put the person on the plan. We can wait 90 days to do that if we're a large employer. With a part-time employee, Virginia says if you're a part-timer for the state of Virginia, you can't work more than 29 hours. Well, in that case, we have no obligation. But for the people who are the seasonals or the part-timers whose hours go up and down, these variable hour employees, we have three options. If we're a large employer, we have three options. Small employer, we don't have to worry about them. We don't have to cover anybody. But with a large employer, we can say, all right, I'm not sure if you're full-time or not, so I'm going to put you on the plan. Well, the problem is that's going to cost money, uh, both you and the employee, and you may not want, that may not be the best alternative for you. The section, the second option is to say, all right, I don't know if they're going to be full-time or not, averaging 30 hours a week or more, so I'm not going to put them on the plan. Well, the risk there is that they may go on the exchange, get a subsidy, and you may receive a penalty. The third option you have is to say, I don't know if you're full-time or not employee. So before I determine that you're eligible for coverage as a full-time employee, I'm going to count your hours first, you variable hour employee. The law is providing a safe harbor. The concept is, I'm going to look back for a period of time and count your hours. And if you've averaged 30 hours a week in that time, well, I'm going to provide you with coverage for a period of time. And if you haven't, you're not allowed to be on our plan for a period of time. And in between times, I can have a, a waiting period. That's the concept. Before I cover you, I'm going to make sure that you really are a full-time employee. That is, you're averaging 30 hours a week. Now here's what the law says you can do if you want to use this method. Again, the three options with these variable hour employees are cover them, don't cover them, or before you cover them, count up their hours. And the law is saying to us as employers, we can set up a, a counting period, a standard measurement period. Employer, you can select the period of time. It can be 3 to 12 months long. It is a standard measurement period. Once a person has uh, worked in that period and you've counted up the hours, uh, you can then wait 90 days. We'll call that an administrative period. And then the person will be on the plan or off the plan for a period of time called a stability period. And that can be as long as the measurement period, it can, but with one exception. The measurement period, the shortest period of time you can measure them is three months. Once you've determined they're eligible for coverage or not eligible for coverage, the stability period, that's got to be at least six months. Otherwise, you cover them or don't cover them for as long as you have measured them. So here's what I'd like you to do. Take a look at this chart, and it seems a little bit complicated, but it's really not. And what I'd like you to do is uh, stick to the basics on looking at this law. Count them, control them, and classify them. So 
this employer, let's presume the mandate is still in effect, not for 2015, but for 2014. This employer said, all right, I've counted up my workforce, and I've determined that I've got 50 employees. And the first day of my plan year is July 1st of 2014. And when I look at my workforce, I've got these variable hour employees. They're seasonals, they're part-timers, their hours go up and down, depends on conditions. So uh, I was told that I have three options. Cover them, well, I don't want to do that, it's too expensive. Don't cover them. No, I don't want to do that because I'm afraid of a penalty. The third option I have is to set up a, a period where I count their hours. And if they're full time, then I've got to put them on the plan. And I've got to put them on the plan in the first day of the plan year in 2014. Now we're going to make that 2015 with the mandate being delayed. But let's presume it's, it's still in effect before the delay. The first day of my plan year is July 1st of 2014. So that's the date on which I have to enroll my full-timers. I'm going to put in a 90-day waiting period. So I'm going to back off the calendar from July 1st of 2014. I'm going to put in this administrative period of a couple of months. And then I'm going to set up a 12-month measurement period. It's going to go from May 1st of 2013 to April 30th of 2014. And in that period, if an employee has averaged 30 hours per week in each month in that period, okay, they're going to be on the plan from July 1st of 2014 until June 30th of 2015. Now, if in that measurement period the person hasn't worked 30 hours per week each month in that period, the person is not going to be eligible to be on the plan for that entire year. After that first year is over, if the person remains a variable hour employee, I'm going to count up the person's hours again in the second year. And I'm doing it in the third year, and I will do it year after year as long as the person's in that variable hour status. So let's take a look at this as an example. Uh, the employer says, all right, I'm going to use a 12-month measurement period. Generally speaking, the longer the measurement period, the greater the number of disqualifications. So the employer says, I'm going to use, I can use 3 to 12 months, but I've decided I'm going to use 12. Uh, and, I'm going to, uh, and I'm going to use a 12-month stability period. And between October 15th and December, the end of December, uh, I'm going to have that as my waiting period. So I'm going to enroll people on the plan. My full-timers have to go on the plan. First day of my plan year is January 1st of 2015. So we have two employees that have worked for the organization, Annie and Bart. They've been there for several years. They're part-timers. Their hours go up and down depending on uh, the conditions. Now, in that measurement period, Annie and, both, and Bart both worked. But their hours varied. Annie worked full-time during that period. She averaged 30 hours per week in each month in that period. Bart didn't. He just didn't have the same number of hours. The result is Annie is eligible for coverage for the entire 12 month stability period, all of 2015, because in the measurement period she qualified. Bart can't get on the plan. He is off uh, for 2015. Now, if Annie's go, hours go down as a variable hour employee, if her hours go down in 2015, it doesn't make any difference. Her coverage is stable. She is in a stability period. If BART didn't qualify for coverage in 2015, but along the way his hours went up, he's still not eligible for coverage. He's still a very low employee, and he is not eligible for coverage for the entire period. For most of you, uh, what you're going to find is when you work this out, that if you use a 12-month measurement period and, and basically take the first day of your plan year, and go back 15 months, use the first 12 for a measurement period and three months for a waiting period, that's when you'll have the greatest number of disqualifications. Now, um, there are two periods involved. With people we already have, it's called the standard measurement period. For people that we hire, we can call it an initial measurement period that would start with the date of hire. They don't have to be the same, incidentally. 
you could use a six-month initial measurement period and a 12-month standard measurement period. If you have, uh, in terms of classifying the workforce, if you have per diem employees, uh, we can no longer say, well, we don't know if you're entitled to coverage because you're per diem. We don't know how many hours you work. Now we have to either track their hours or use an equivalency to say, well, if you're a per diem and you work one hour, we're going to call that eight hours of work for the day or 40 hours of work for the week. There are some organizations where the per diems, uh, there are many of these companion services where uh, they, they employ an army of per diem employees who generally work 12-hour shifts in the uh, home of a, of a senior citizen and they are not getting benefits. And for those organizations, this law may have a very, very pronounced impact. Rehires and breaks in service may be very important for uh, our industry. If you have someone, a variable hour employee, a seasonal employee, and that person has worked for you, terminates, and then is rehired, the question is, you have them on a measurement period, do they start from zero or do they pick up when you rehire them from where they lay, uh, left off? The answer is this. If they're off the job for 26 weeks and then they're rehired, they start from zero. If they're off the job for more than four weeks but less than 26 weeks, there's a special rule. More than four weeks off the job, but less than 26 weeks and they get rehired. The, if the, in that circumstance, if an employee's time on the job is less than the employee's time off it, that employee starts from zero. It sounds complicated, but it's really not. Uh, here's the example. An employee works for three weeks, is terminated, and then t 10 weeks later you rehire the employee. So the person's been off the job for more than four weeks but less than 26 weeks. Now all we do is this. How long was the person working for us? Answer three weeks. How long was the person away from us? Answer 10 weeks. If the period on the job, three weeks, is less than the period off the job, 10 weeks, the person starts from zero. For some of you, the break in service rule for variable hour employees may become uh, particularly important. So I want to bring that your attention. Leaves of absence, generally speaking, people on a leaves of, uh, leave of absence, workers comp, that type, LCD, LTD, uh, that's going to be considered time worked and there are special rules for teachers. Here's what I'd like you to do on this. Um, this matter of counting, controlling, and classifying, um, when you come down to the classification, do we have full-time, part-time, seasonal employees? Um, and if the answer is, yep, we have full-time, part-time, well, that's certainly going to go into uh, are we large or small. Seasonal, are we large or small, because we have a special allowance um, for seasonal employers that you remain a small employer if you're not over 50 for more than four months in a calendar year, and the people that threw you over are seasonals. But then, it also comes down to uh, that type of workforce where their hours vary, the classification of the workforce, and uh, addresses the question of are they averaging 30 hours a week, are they full-time employees? And where the, where the answer is, well, their hours vary, then you have three choices. Cover them, don't cover them, or use this method to count their hours first uh, set up a standard measurement period and then a stability period and an administrative period. Measurement period is I'm just going to count up your hours uh, for a period of time between three months and 12 months. Stability period, Annie and Bart. For one year following your measurement period, you're either on the plan or off the plan for the entire stability period. And the administrative period is the waiting time in between. There are two types of employees. They are variable hour employees, and they are either new or ongoing employees. They're either currently on board or new hires. A variable hour employee is one whose hours cannot be ascertained to be full-time at the time of hire. Um, the next step is to 
start tracking the hours of those individuals. People who average 30 hours a week in each month in a measurement period are entitled to be considered full time. Then to look at your plan year, because the target date for you is going to be the first day of your plan year, if you're a large employer, the first day of your plan year in 2015. In the example that we looked at, it was July 1st. But whatever your plan year is, is the date on which, if you're a large employer, you have to cover your full-timers. And then what I would do is I would set up these uh, measurement periods. And the best place to start is the first day of your plan year. Back off uh, a period of 90 days for a waiting period, and then use whatever measurement period you want. But I think you're going to find that 12 months is the optimal measurement period. And that's what will be the stability period. Now, the last thing is minimum essential coverage, and I will give you the shorthand on this. Uh, you really don't have to worry about it unless you're self-insured. In your states, uh, insurance carriers are not going to offer plans that don't meet the minimum essential coverage definition. So if you're in, you have an insurance policy, minimum coverage is not going to be something that you're going to have to worry about. If you're self-insured, of course, that will be a uh, different matter, and there are calculators for that. The last thing I want to point out to you is depends on your state, uh, but there is a on the exchange something called a small business health operations plan, a shop plan, whereby a small employer can say, all right, um, our group health plan is going to be the plan on the New Jersey, well, actually, New Jersey would be the federal exchange but on the New York Exchange or the Connecticut Exchange or the Massachusetts Exchange. Unfortunately, the Federal Exchange doesn't have a shop at this point. But let's take Connecticut. Um, Connecticut has a shop with three options. The employer can say, our group health plan is going to be the Connecticut uh, shop plan. And, what we, and the three options we have are these. I'm going to select the Anthem Bronze plan, says the employer, is our plan. So employees, you can take our benchmark plan, the Anthem Bronze plan, or you can select, and I'm going to give you a certain amount of money to pay for the coverage. You can take that plan or you can select any other bronze plan uh, offered on the exchange in the shop, but I'm still defining the contribution that I'm going to make. That's the first option. Um, the second option is the employer says, we're selecting as our benchmark plan the Anthem Bronze. That's what I'm going to pay for it. You may take the Anthem Bronze plan or any other Anthem plan that's being offered in the exchange. But the most I'm going to pay is, is that defined contribution. The third is the employer says, OK, our benchmark plan is the Anthem Bronze plan. Uh, take it or leave it. You may enroll in that or not enroll in that, but that's the only option that we have. In Connecticut, as I showed you earlier, the shop carriers are different than the carriers that are offering uh, individual coverage, and that's going to vary with your state. Now, that's an overview of healthcare reform, and we've gone through a fair amount of information in a relatively short period of time. But what I'd like to do is ask you to just um, look at this as being a compliance obligation, whether large or small. If you're a small employer, the obligations I've said a couple of times are relatively easy. It's a notice. All your employees have an obligation with government, but you don't have an obligation to provide it. If you're a large employer, you've got an obligation to provide employees who are full-timers um, with coverage which is adequate and affordable. And uh, my advice would be to all of us, this. Remember the slide that I said in 2016, employers are going to get notices from the federal government saying, uh, we believe you owe us some money because one of your employees uh, went on the exchange and received the subsidy. Uh, if you set this up is with some basic documentation and look at this as a compliance uh, obligation, this will become uh, less onerous. And I'd like you to keep in mind um, that shorthand of count uh, classify and control um, your workforce. And if you do that uh, and look at the options that we have here, I think this will become um, less onerous and certainly less complicated. Again, what we've done is go through an overview, and I'm so glad that um, 
you know, we have the opportunity uh, to come together here and, and to talk about this. I can assure you that uh, there are many employers throughout the United States that don't have the benefit of the service that you're being provided, who in 2016 uh, will be absolutely blindsided by this law. Now, having said that, we have a little time that's available for questions, and I wonder if we have any. Uh, yeah, Bob, thank you very much. A lot of information there. Um, and I'm sure that there's um, more questions, and we can, um, we can entertain questions if people t um, chat them in um, via their computer. Um, a couple that have come in already is um, are, uh, what about foreign workers, such as those on H-2A visas? Do you know anything about this, Bob, whether they count for your large or small employer determination and whether uh, they would be? Yeah they're, not an ex okay. yeah, they're not an exception under this law. Now, there's no obligation uh, when you're dealing with people that are, uh, not that you would have these, illegal aliens, but in terms of the count themselves, there is no exclusion. We're really counting the number of employees uh, that we have, including the H-2As. Okay. Um, another question here that came in is, I'm a small farmer in New York and purchase health insurance for one employee, um, and I receive a tax credit for part of my premium costs for the small business tax credit program. The plan is ACA compliant, but I've heard that if I do not receive, that I will, sorry, I've heard that I will not receive the credit for next year unless I get a policy through the state exchange. Do I need to cancel this policy and buy a new one through the exchange just to maintain uh. the tax yeah, if you want to maintain the tax credit, the answer is yes. Now, in 2014, the tax credit goes from the premium tax credit goes from 35 percent to 50 percent, but it's for coverage which is purchased on the exchange. So, if you're providing that uh, that policy now off the exchange, which is fine, that tax credit is available. Now, remember, there's a limit on that tax credit of two years. So, if you provided that already it may not make a difference if you've gotten the tax credit for two years. It will be getting it for two years. Um, but, but yes, that you're absolutely correct that the tax credit will only be available in 2015 for a policy that you purchase on the exchange. Okay. Um, thanks. Another question relates to the seasonal, um, the seasonality except exemption. Yep. Um, if you're over 50 employees for just four months, it applies to the business. But as far as the employee, is it 120 days continuous calendar days, or could it be non-contiguous? Non-contiguous. It's 120 days in the calendar year. So if someone worked for you in the spring, say, planting, and then came back for harvest season, um, as long as they were below that 120, they'd be seasonal. That's correct. That's correct. Tired on a seasonal basis, and the person does not work more than 120 days in the calendar year and they don't have to be consecutive. Okay. Um, let's see. We pay 65% of the premium for full-time employees and 58 for part-time employees. We define part-time as 35 hours per Massachusetts law. Do we need to pay the full-time percentage at 30 hours now? The answer is yes. Oddly enough, um, you know, the... the um, the questioner from Massachusetts, you know, you, you, the folks in Massachusetts have had far more experience with this concept than any other state in the country. Unfortunately, Mass, the state law, the Massachusetts, the law of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and the federal law are slightly different, and you've identified one of the differences, that full-time under this law is defined as 30 hours per week, whereas Massachusetts has defined it differently. You're going to have to conform to the federal standard, and it will be 30 hours a week. Okay. Uh, here's another question. Um, it's about dependent coverage. Um, as you've uh, pointed out, the affordability concept applies only to single coverage, right. but, um, if, if you but you have to offer dependent coverage. If an employee... Yeah cannot afford that dependent coverage, can they go on the exchange for their spouse and benefits? Uh, spouse no. And dependent? no, that's one of the great uh, uh, inequities, as some people would say, in this law. A taxpayer has to have coverage for him or herself and dependents, but the measure of affordability is 
single only coverage. And if the coverage offered by the employer is adequate and affordable, measured by single only coverage, that renders the employee and the employee's dependents ineligible to get coverage on the exchange. It's a very strange thing, but it really comes out to uh, coverage for dependents may render the coverage unaffordable, but the dependents still can still not get a subsidy. The measuring plan is going to be the bronze plan, and the measuring uh, coverage class is employee only. And if the coverage for employee only is adequate and affordable, uh, even though it's unaffordable when you turn on dependence coverage, the dependents still can't get a subsidy. Okay. Um, when counting the hours an employee works in a month, is that a calendar month, i.e., from the first to the first of the month to the end? What if a pay period bridged two months? You can you can use the first day of the the pay period in the month, uh, and you can use the last day. You can. Uh, uh, in the month. So you could, the law does allow you to use uh, pay periods that spill over uh, into the preceding or succeeding month. Okay. Um, another question about seasonality. If an employee works nine months out of the year, can they be considered a seasonal employee? It seems like they'd have to, um, you'd have to go by that measurement period you described, right? Yeah, uh, remember a seasonal employee is one who's hired on a seasonal basis and doesn't work more than uh, 120 calendar days. But yeah, you would use the measurement period. Okay. Um, clarifying, if a business has greater than 50 employees for four months or less due to seasonal workers, then it's not required to provide coverage no matter how many FTEs for those months and no matter what the ultimate average of FTEs for the year is. Yeah, there's this, this, yes, that's correct. It's a limited allowance uh, for this employer with seasonal employees. And what it says is count up your workforce, and if you're not over 50 uh, for more than four months, so you're, you're over 50, okay, for four or fewer months in the year. And in those months where you're over 50, the only reason you are over 50 is because you brought on seasonal employees then you remain a small employer for that year. Okay. With no obligation to provide coverage. Okay. Um, here's one. If I had an employee more than 30 hours for eight months, would they need to be offered COBRA for the remaining four months if they, after they leave? Yes. Yeah. This okay. law doesn't. This law doesn't alter COBRA. Okay. Um, Another question about Massachusetts, because it has the, the sort of two overlaying laws at, in play. Would an individual have to pay both Massachusetts and federal penalties for not having insurance? Yeah, if a person doesn't have coverage under the Massachusetts law, the penalty under Massachusetts is really the loss of the personal exemption under the Massachusetts tax code. Uh, so the person would be penalized in that way for noncompliance with the state tax law, and at the same time, the person will be uh, penalized on the person's federal return for noncompliance with the uh, federal law. So it would be the worst of both worlds. Okay. Thanks for that. Um, another question um, for a larger employer. What does it mean that you have to automatically enroll employees if you have more than 200 employees? Yeah. If you have, uh, in 2015, if you have 200 or more on the first day of your plan year, 200 or more full-time employees, you have to, with your new hires, you have to automatically enroll them at the time of hire in the lowest plan that you offer. Now, they can opt out of that, but the default position is 200 or more with a full-timer, you enroll them first and they opt out rather than our, our current method of they can opt in. Okay. Um, if you only operate eight months a year, can your four months of non-operation reduce your average number of employees for the year? Absolutely. Absolutely. So you're going to be counting up that workforce uh, in um, each year. In, in 2014, you're going to be counting up that workforce. So in eight months, you're going to have a certain number of employees. And then in four months, you're going to have all zeros. And so you're going to be averaging up, you're going to be totaling those uh, monthly counts 
in dividing by 12 to give you that average. So those four months of zero will offset that average considerably. Okay. Um, are salaried employers and owners or perhaps family members included in an employee count? Yeah, they are. Um, they are, um, you know, there's a special exception. The, the, the questioner that mentioned the premium tax credit um, probably recognized the fact that family, uh, that owners and family members aren't counted for that. But for purposes of the employer employee count, the answer is yeah, there's no exclusion for family members or uh, owners. If the owners serve in the capacity of not only being owners, but also uh, employees. A partner in a law firm is an example of that, where they are uh, partners, but still are providing also services working. and receiving compensation. Yeah. OK. Um, we've reached the end of our questions. If, if we have any additional ones, if people want to text them in, we can keep going here. Um, I'll give you a few minutes to make, perhaps recap, Bob, if you'd like to um, sum it up. Yeah, I would. First of all, I want to sum up by saying I think it's great that Farm Credit East is is providing the opportunity uh, to review this matter. As I said earlier, I think that uh, for employers that don't have the benefit of advisory services like this, um, I can assure you that in 2016 that those IRS notices will be going out and many of those employers are going to be caught uh, short. So the fact that you've got um, a service through Farm Credit East that's uh, giving you some direction to the extent that it's useful to you and allows you to consider this as a compliance project, so much the better. This sounds, in a short period of time, uh, we've covered a lot of ground, but I want you to, to return to the objective of this law. You know, I, I cited the Connecticut statistic of 340,000 people without insurance. In the United States, it's between 34 and 45 million, depending upon the study that's reached and, and are used. And the thing to keep in mind is that Connecticut statistic, only 9% of them are working full time. The rest are not employed or they're working on the margins of uh, employment. And some of them in, uh, work uh, with uh, greater concentrations in certain industries. Seasonal employers and seasonal employees would be an example of that. So I think it makes sense to recognize that um, we have uh, some unique characteristics in uh, our industry. And as a consequence of that, that means we've got to do a little bit more in the way of looking at this with um, uh, the objective of compliance and defensive documentation. None of this is particularly difficult. Uh, I think that the idea of counting, controlling, and classifying, that shorthand will probably work very well for you. I will caution you that you will not be able to look at this um, from this in, in be guided by the conventional press. So if Farm Credit East is providing you with uh, service and expertise that's available to you, I would, I would definitely uh, take advantage of this. This is not um, this is not an insoluble problem, and it's an, the, it's not an insurmountable task. Uh, but it's not the kind of thing that you can kind of hope to com to uh, comply with through uh, reading the, the local newspaper. So I would say look at this as being a compliance project. Uh, begin at the beginning with the uh, the objective of this law. And if you take in and just work through the steps that we've looked at, am I a large employer? If so, what's my obligation? Well, it's to provide adequate and affordable coverage to my full-time employees. Well, am I large? Who are my full-timers? Is my coverage affordable? Is my coverage adequate? And um, then I think if you work through those basic questions, uh, you're going to arrive at, this, at, at the right place with plenty of time. OK. Um, we have sort of a housekeeping couple of questions that have come in um, relating to recording of the webinar, uh, slides, and printed information from Farm Credit East. All of that is available on our, our main website, farmcredit.east.com. There is a link on the home page. 
um, that can direct you to healthcare reform resources. And in that will be the will after this is over will be posted the recording of this webinar as well as uh, articles that we've put together on the topic. A um, couple of other questions that have come in. Um, does one hour work to count as a full day worked for the 120 day count for a seasonal employee? You know, that's a very interesting question. The law really, uh, the law really doesn't, the ACA really doesn't address that. Uh, but the, there are other aspects of the, uh, the Fair Labor Standards Act that would say yes, that if the person works any portion of a day, it's going to be considered a day. Okay. A rather specific question about an owner. Um, a member of an LLC that functions as a manager and is compensated through a guaranteed payment, would they be counted as a full-time employee in the census for the business? Uh, based on those characteristics, I would say the answer is yes. That if It sounds to me as if the owner is um, in the capacity of owner and also a person who is receiving uh, compensation in exchange for service. In, in that case, the person is both an owner and employee. Okay. Um, another question. We have a high deductible plan. Does the same affordability test apply? I assume the affordability refers to only premiums and not any deductibles involved, right? That's, that, that's exactly right. The, the, the matter of affordability is based on premium contribution. Okay. Um, we have another question here relating to, I assume, the, the uh, idea of the measurement period. Yeah. Um, why is there a 90-day admin period in there? There doesn't have to be. It's just an allowance. Um, but what the law is is saying is when you're going through this matter of counting up their hours, uh, an employer may need time to uh, allow the, to get the enrollment materials to the employee and for the employee to uh, make up his or her mind. So there's an allowance to have a 90-day waiting period. You don't have to have one, but there's an allowance to have one. Also, that waiting period can be put at um, the beginning of a payroll period that doesn't have to be 90 consecutive days. So it, it may be that um, there are uh, periods of time that you want to use as a waiting period. For example, the employee is hired on the 14th uh, of the month, but enrollment would start on the 1st of the month. Well, you can use that period of maybe time between as part of the waiting period. It's not a requirement, though. It's, it's an allowance, but not a requirement. OK. Um, another question is, um, I guess, looking for an opinion uh, a little bit. What do you think the collectability of this penalty by the IRS really is? Um, <laughs> That's a great question. Um, well, I, I, you know, the folks in Massachusetts could probably speak to it from the standpoint of experience. There is a, um, a legal question about, there really is a, a, a very interesting legal question about the authority of the IRS to collect this penalty uh, from the standpoint of the structure of the law. So. I don't know if that one will be going to the Supreme Court or not, but I suspect the answer is the IRS is probably going to have that authority. Uh, from the standpoint of collecting the uh, penalty in the first year um, of compliance, I think we're on a giant shakedown cruise, and I suspect um, that it's going to be very, very inefficient. As time goes on, though, particularly in 2015, when exchanges will re be reporting to the IRS, employers will be reporting to the IRS, and carriers will be reporting to the IRS, I suspect that our efficiency is going to go way, way up in collecting the penalty. So if it passes legal muster, um, I think it's also going to, we're going to be moving toward uh, a more efficient uh, collection system through the IRS. Okay. Um, a question came in, and this is common on uh, a lot of small farms. Um, what about alternative work arrangements, such as unpaid school interns, um, volunteers, uh, that sort of thing. How do do they count to the towards the full employee full time employee count? No, no, they wouldn't. Um, it's really going to come down to the whether or not the person is in the capacity of an employee. And so, um, theoretically, um, volunteers wouldn't be. 
they're not employees. Um, independent contractors wouldn't be. But um, who's an employee and who isn't is going to be one of the um, issues under this law. I can tell you that one of the one of the things that you'll, we will all see is more employers attempting to say that a person is an independent contractor and not an employee. Uh, but the volunteers should be excluded. Independent contractors will be excluded. Uh, frankly, uh, there's a big issue concerning temporary employees through an agency and whether or not they're going to be counted as an employee of the agency or an employee of the um, farm that's receiving those services. Well, it's one of those undetermined issues. So, yeah, along those lines, um, a lot of farms use like labor brokers or, you know, worker, various worker service providers. Yeah. Um, so that's that remains uh, a little bit questionable there. Yeah, it does. Um, the Department of Labor has said we don't, uh, they've come out with a, a we don't know yet position on that. So the contracted laborers, the um, the least employees, uh, contract labor leased employees and temporary employees, the IRS said, uh, even frankly, to a certain extent, seasonal employees, they said, we've got to do some more work on this. So we're waiting for guidance. I can tell you that for the temporary agencies in particular, uh, they are on pins and needles uh, over the question of whether or not they have the obligation to provide the coverage or their clients do. But we need more work to be done by the government on that. Okay. Well, it looks like we're wrapping it up with questions. I don't have anything else at this time, so um, I think we'll we'll wrap it up. Um, right. Thank you so much for providing me with the opportunity. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Bob. Um, I'll mention that our next webinar coming up is the 2014 Dairy Outlook. That'll be on Friday, January 17th, 2014, at the same time, um, 10 to noon. It'll be featuring Mark Stevenson, a dairy economist from the University of Wisconsin, Carl Zimek from Cornell University, as well as a reaction panel of Farm Credit East consultants and clients. Um, to register, you can visit farmcredit.com slash webinars uh, or email for more information. Um, with that, I will uh, wrap it up, and thank you very much for attending.